Today we're going to see the Sistine Chapel exhibit. I can't believe I saw this in person. It was so cool seeing this. I can't believe it took him four years to finish it and just like seeing the process of how he made it and how he brought all these pictures to life. It was so cool to see. Which was going to be a huge mess. Two. The chapel was not going to close while Michelangelo was painting, so normal scaffolding covering the chapel floor wasn't going to work. Three, it's Rome, and it can easily get to 90 degrees in the summer, and that's just standing outside on the ground. Four, Michelangelo was painting in fresco style, which he had very little experience with, and is one of the most difficult forms of painting ever. Five, the height within the chapel was crazy. The ceiling was over 60 feet above the ground. That's over six stories tall. The fund, a CICF fund focused on inspiring philanthropy. Additional support provided by the Crystal DeHaan Family Foundation in honor of the children and families of Crystal House. First priority was to build some sort of scaffold or platform. Michelangelo hires the top dog scaffold builder in Rome, and he decides to hang the scaffold from massive ropes. This did not fly with Michelangelo who immediately tosses out the idea. Michelangelo then decides to drill holes on either side of the chapel walls. Then, he takes planks and inserts them into the wall, which then allows the scaffold builder a base to start. Michelangelo's idea was to create two arches with steps that contoured in curves of the ceiling. This design was ingenious and left the floor of the chapel clear for the Pope. However, they knew debris and dust would be an issue, so they hung a massive fabric under the platform. This solved another issue, which was blocking the dizzying 60-foot drop from the scaffold. Probably 
finally, most important to Michael Andrews, this prevented anyone from seeing the work that the book was conceived. After removing the old plaster, things were about to get started. But fresco painting needs two layers of plaster on the wall. The first is called the Arishio, and the second, which is called the Intanaka. We will investigate further into this within another episode, simply because there is so much sweet science happening here. If you are about to throw down 150 different scenes using one of the most difficult painting techniques known to man, you are going to need a team of assistants. After much deliberation, he finally decides on four assistants, and man, he was going to need them. Let's just quickly run through what an average day 60 feet above the ground looked like for Team Michael Andrews. Man, that's really high. First, the entire team had to climb the 40-foot ladder to the lowest planks. That's over three times the average swimming pool depth of 12 feet, just in case you were wondering. Once up, they had to climb steps to reach the additional 20 feet to the top. Light came in through small windows by day, but it was torches only at night, and yes, they worked at night. Next, they would apply the Ensenaco layer. Mixing this paste was no easy task, and also pretty dangerous. Keep in mind, one of the primary ingredients was quicklime. Know what else they used quicklime for? They would sprinkle it on dead bodies to quicken the decomposition and lessen the stench in the church courtyard, where the dead would wait to be buried. Powerful stuff. The next step would be for the artist to transfer the cartoon to the wall. This was basically a drawing done in graphite, which was usually transferred by poking hundreds of holes around the sketch, and then using powdered charcoal to transfer the lines to the wet plaster. Again, crazy time-consuming and difficult process. Of course, all these paints had to be hand-mixed as well. Mixing these pigments was an art in and of itself. Finally, Michelangelo is ready to begin. The first scene he decides to tackle is the biblical story of the flood. Of course, in perfect fashion, he runs into all types of problems. He had a lot of corrections, which meant he had to erase. Think erasing is easy on plaster? Nope, you're right. Basically, you had two options. One, scrape off the wet plaster before it dries. Two, if it is already dry, grab the hammer and chisel, baby. You have your work cut out for you. Another issue Team Michelangelo was having is that mildew was forming on the plaster. His team was adding too much water too quickly to the plaster mixture. And they were also adding binding agents or glues to help adhere the paint. However, this wasn't allowing the plaster to dry quickly enough. Mildew, not good. So what does Michelangelo do? He fires almost his entire team and decides to paint boy on fresco, which means to paint directly on wet plaster. Michelangelo may have lied down here and there, but more often than not, you would have seen Michelangelo painting standing up with his head turned up. Seriously, can you imagine how painful this would get after days, weeks, months, and even years of doing this? My neck just hurts thinking about it. Maybe this is why he was known to be pretty grumpy and antisocial. In addition, he was also known to be crazy dirty and smelly. Apparently his dad had told him, never wash yourself. So he would just sleep in the same clothes and just keep on going. I mean, even people of his day thought that was gross. And, and these were people who were at most bathing like once a week. As Michelangelo continued to paint, one issue that always seemed to come up was Pope Julius. He would often come around and, and yell up to Michelangelo, Michelangelo, when are you going to finish the chapel? And I love Michelangelo's response, when I can. Of course, the Pope wasn't about to be one up and responded with, you don't want me to have you thrown off the red scaffolding? At one point, the Pope, in a moment of frustration, smacked Michelangelo with a stick. Of course, he later tells him, the stick hitting was just a sign of my affection. Right. At one point, Pope Julius even disguises himself to see the work in progress. Michelangelo, not buying any of this, sees the Pope ascending the ladder. He quickly grabs the planks of wood and hurls them at the Pope. It was on July 15th of 1510 at 9 a.m. The first section of the ceiling was unveiled. As you can imagine, everyone was completely speechless of what Michelangelo had created. Even the painter Raphael, whom Michelangelo despised, said he was completely amazed. Nearly a year later, after having the scaffolding moved to the other half of the chapel, Michelangelo is ready to start tackling scenes from the book of Genesis. He decides to start with what is probably the most famous of his paintings, the creation of Adam. Do you have any idea why this particular painting or, or scene is so popular? 
first, the goal of any respectable Renaissance artist was to create figures that looked very real. And Michelangelo did that while also creating what many called the perfect specimen of a human. Adam doesn't look like he spent the day at the gym, that's for sure. Michelangelo also painted God in full length. I mean, complete with kneecaps and toes exposed. Rest assured, no one was doing that. Most early Christian art simply represented God as a, a giant hand emerging from heaven. As Michelangelo continued to paint scenes, his confidence and speed continued to increase as well. In fact, when he finally gets to the last Genesis scene, he completes the entire painting in one day. What? That's right, one day. That was over 60 square feet of wet plaster. Even though he was moving crazy fast and creating beautiful images, he was definitely getting burned out. He even wrote home saying, I lead a miserable existence. I have not been happy for almost 15 years, mamma mia. Okay, so he's being a bit dramatic, but come on. Nearly four years of doing this, I think most of us would go a little crazy. Hey, what was your saying, fratello? Michael ends up now seeing the finish line, tackles the crucifixion of Hamas, which he painted in 24 days. This figure was the most beautiful he had created, but was also the most difficult. He even went so far as to create very detailed sketches for this one. Numerous nail holes can even be seen today where he attached the cartoon. Moral of the story, finish strong. By the end of October in 1512, he finally sends a passionate end-up letter to Florence stating, I have finished the chapel. I have been painting. Seriously, four years, all that work, all that paint, all that neck pain, and that's all he says? This guy just cracks me. Anyway, on October 31st, 1512, on the eve of All Saints, the Pope hosts this banquet in the Vatican. His goal is to end the evening with his 17 cardinals seeing the finished chapel. But of course, the Pope drags this evening out with a long dinner, a couple of different comedies in the theater, and even a nap. Finally, at sunset, he and his buddies head to the Sistine Chapel. I imagine the group making their way through the dark corridors and hallways lit only by torches as they follow the smell of fresh plaster and paint. Once inside the massive 60 foot high chapel, they look up with the room fully lit with torches and the remainder of the setting sun, and they look all around the room and see the most colorful, beautifully depicted images from the Bible ever created. Add to that all the architectural elements Michelangelo created, which added so much grandeur and awe. The group, including the Pope, was speechless. I'll tell you this much. What inspires me is Michelangelo's willingness to try something he had little experience with and was known to be incredibly difficult. He not only did the work, but pushed himself nonetheless, which is probably why he was often referred to as a saint, simply because of what he accomplished in the Sistine Chapel. Never underestimate the potential of what you create. Even though the Mona Lisa may be the most famous artwork in the world, I would argue this bit of painting would be a close second. Michelangelo di Lodovico Guerrotti Simoni, we'll just call him Michelangelo, was born March 6, 1475, in Caprice, Italy. Buongiorno, what happened? Yeah, he wasn't always the happiest artist, but we'll get back to that later. Michelangelo had four brothers, and his father was a magistrate, and his mother stayed at home with the kids. Now, when Michelangelo was an infant, she became pretty sick. In fact, Michelangelo ended up having to have a wet nurse, uh, so he ended up living with a family of stonecutters. Interestingly, Michelangelo said it was because of this stonecutter wet nurse that he drank in the hammer and chisel. Yeah, not too sure about that. By the way, did you know Michelangelo didn't want to be known as a painter? In fact, he would probably be insulted if you first referred to him as a painter and not a sculptor. Seriously, you did not just refer to me as painter. Did you? Like many 16-year-olds, Michelangelo didn't really care for school, so he often would skip class and head to a nearby church to watch the painters. His family detested art and felt like he was a disgrace to the family. It was definitely not a suitable profession for a man. I think once Michelangelo started to make a name for himself as an artist, he loved to remind everybody back home. You can tell since he would always sign his letters home with Michelangelo, sculptor in Rome. Yeah, right. And 
or to forget the past. After realizing that Michelangelo had some artistic talent, his dad encouraged him to find an apprenticeship where he could learn more about art. He went from a painter's workshop to then studying within a powerful, rich, elite family within Florence, the Medici family. Did I mention they were the rulers of Florence? Yeah, they were. Working with this family gave him special privileges. One of those was being able to study dead bodies at the church waiting to be buried. This fueled his passion to understand human anatomy, and unfortunately, the stench and nastiness of the experience started to make him sick. Enough of that. Just a few short years later, when Michelangelo was only 25 years old, it was apparent he had a black belt skull. After relocating to Rome, one of the cardinals within the Catholic Church commissioned him to create a sculpture. Michelangelo, being pretty cocky at this time, said, It will be the most beautiful work in marble room I've ever seen. A bit confident, right? Actually, it's this sculpture, La Pieta. Have you ever seen this one before? You bet you have. Check it out. Michelangelo sculpted this from a single piece of marble stone. What amazes me is it only took him one year to complete this six foot by six foot sculpture. Have any idea what the, the title means? Well, Pieta simply means pity or compassion, which makes sense considering the, the subject being Christ and his mother Mary. So you're probably asking yourself, uh, what makes this sculpture so incredible? Let me explain. Check out the details in the folds and the ribs and muscles on the body. All this movement these details create. Trying to sculpt these details uh, was incredibly hard. And trust me, people knew it. Which is why many pilgrims would come to Rome just to see this sculpture. After returning to Rome, he hears about a sculpture that two other artists had abandoned because it was too difficult. Fueled with confidence from La Pieta, he takes over the job. David took three years to sculpt, probably due to its size of 17 feet. David quickly becomes the pride of Florence, and they even nicknamed it the Giant. After Michelangelo finishes this sculpture, his fame starts to build. In fact, word got around to the Pope, Pope Julius II. Immediately, Pope Julius commissions Michelangelo to create his tomb. This was huge for Michelangelo, especially since all he wanted to do was sculpt. And designing the tomb for the Pope was a huge honor. Michelangelo is so pumped to get going, he starts gathering a team, pouring the stone needed, and, and working on his idea. Of course, right in the middle of this, the Pope turns his attention and funding to rebuild St. Peter's Basilica, which was falling apart. You have to keep in mind that Rome has basically turned into a cow pasture at this point. And, and the Pope wants to return Rome back to its powerful roots. A very Renaissance idea, I might add. Needless to say, he is super frustrated with the Pope, and when he wouldn't pay Michelangelo back for the stone he bought, he heads back to Florence, vowing never to return to Rome. Uh, that is until the Pope sends him a request. Have any idea what he's about to ask him to do? That's right, grab your paintbrush and get back to Rome and paint the Sistine Chapel. Let me tell you his response to the Pope. I do not wish to attend to anything but the tomb and not the painting. Believe it or not, no one wanted to paint the Sistine Chapel. This wasn't just about the, the painting process. This also had to do with the chapel itself. Let me school you for a minute. The Sistine Chapel was built in 1477 and was designed to the same biblical proportions as the Temple of Solomon, which made it a fortress. The walls of the base are 10 feet thick. Arrow slits added around the outside, and they even added special holes to pour boiling oil out. Pretty crazy. I bet you didn't know this, but the chapel had been painted before by a team of artists with 32 popes painted around the room, and then a blue field of stars was added to the ceiling. However, not even 21 years after the construction, cracks start to appear in the vault. To stop this from getting worse, in 1504 they placed huge iron rods underneath the floor. Of course, now we have a major problem. The ceiling and the walls must be repaired. After putting some of the popes' muscle on Michelangelo, he told him he could only work on the tomb if he painted the Sistine Chapel. He reluctantly agreed. All images of the judgment up to that time had God on the throne in the center, angels and saints ranged along horizontal lines. Michelangelo again started an artistic revolution, developing his story along perpendicular axes. 
His work invades the enormous white wall that seems to explode in a whirlwind of figures that all rotate around a central figure, apparently without rules. All it takes is to observe with a little more attention to see that the scene begins on the left as the blessed rise towards heaven. God is in the center, but this time looks like Christ the Judge, and his position is the same as the Apollo of the Belvedere, the famous statue found in the Vatican and imitated throughout the entire Renaissance. His hand in a circular movement moves the whole scene, letting the damned fall towards hell and helps the blessing into heaven. The last judgment of the Sistine Chapel has nothing to do with the anatomy lessons of the scene. Here, the naked bodies, particularly those of the dead, no longer have noble and composed position. Instead, they're gawky and muddy as they scream and scramble. They're almost caricatures of all that is negative in the human condition. If you concentrate on the scene, you can almost hear the screams of pain, the noise of the souls rushing to their own destinies, and the deafening trumpets that announce the end times. Only in the center does the scene seem suspended in an unreal silence. Even the saints and martyrs, all turning towards Christ, are anxious and terrified as they wait for the final <coughs> verdict to be pronounced. Even the Madonna is timid and resigned to sigh. Some of the blessed kiss each other and hug one another with enormous relief. Up above, outside the circular movement, angels almost threateningly carry the cross and symbols of the Passion. Christ the Judge is wrapped in a blinding light. Nonetheless, both the damned and the blessed can't help looking towards him. In the Last Judgment, too, the images don't all have the same perspective. The figures of the blessed and the damned are randomly grouped or distance themselves, leaving blue spaces. Every corner is frescoed with infinite care given to the tiniest details. Some of the saints are easily recognizable because they hold the symbols of their story or their martyrdom in their hands. St. Peter, on Jesus' right, holds the two keys. St. Lawrence holds the grape, and St. Sebastian kneels, holding the arrows with which he was marked. One of the most famous images is St. Bartholomew, who died skinned alive. The saint, seated on a cloud, is painted as Pietro Aretino, the Tuscan poet who had dared to criticize nudity. But the most celebrated detail of all is the skin that the saint holds in his hand, in which Michelangelo put his self-portrait. In fact, at the height of his creative work, the artist truly felt skinned alive by those insistent criticisms. On the lower right, the angels of the apocalypse sound their trumpets with every breath in their body, blowing out their cheeks to the bursting point to wake the dead. Angels and demons pitilessly let the desperate damned fall into hell. As your gaze drops slowly downwards, the scenes become more and more terrible until you arrive at Karen, who beats the souls away from his boat with an oar and sends them off towards Midas, the judge of hell, wrapped in a serpent. The figure of Midas, besides being recognized as the Pope's master of ceremonies, was also identified with Pierluigi Farnese, son of Pope Paul III, who, in Rome, was known for acts of violence and sodomy. Left, according to the theory of the resurrection of the flesh, the reborn rise into heaven, getting their bodies back. Some of them holding a rosary, criticism of Luther's theories. 